Mark and I are driving along here, just outside between Franschhoek and Stellenbosch in this absolutely exquisite valley, the Bunhoek Valley. And I am driving the van, which is a diesel van. And Mark has had it on biodiesel for the last two months and been really impressed with the response from the car, incredible saving and the fact that we're using oil that would normally be thrown away. It is Biodiesel is made from old chip oil from fast food outlets and uh, it just gives me an absolute thrill to be driving along on chip oil from a fast food outlet, you know. So I must say we're feeling very noble because we're feeling like we're recycling something that would normally be thrown away and then of course I'm feeling we're feeling quite noble because we're using a product that is less damaging to the environment at this point in time and um, saves an enormous amount of money. So we're going to find out from these guys is how do they make the biodiesel, how do they make it so that we can drive with it. You know, I mean you can't just take chip oil and put it straight into your car, although apparently if you've got a, some heating device you can do it as long as you filter the oil. So these are some of the things that I want to know and ask um, how all of this works. Exactly. But literally when that oil starts to get pretty dark brown, yes. and once it starts to discolor, even lightly it becomes highly carcinogenic. Up until that point it's probably, you know, once, you, once it's sort of fresh oil it's carcinogenic, once they've used it a couple of times it's very carcinogenic, now it's highly carcinogenic. It's dark, right. okay, and it really should be dumped, but it's sold to a depot that sells it to place that feeds animals they said yes. put it in what the chicken feed chicken feed pet feed um, dog food dog food dog food absolutely oh, that's terrible yeah I don't think anybody knows you read the dog food packet and it says vegetable oil and you think this is great it's got vegetable oil but it's this highly processed stuff spent spent restaurant horse oil. feed horse feed yes Cows? pretty much pretty much everything anything that's got an energy content or oil in now I can understand why chickens that are fed um, feed actually develop cancer they say that that if you leave the chicken and don't slaughter it before a certain time they develop cancer yeah but if it's if that carcinogenic stuff is in their food no wonder one in three south africans get cancer you're eating the chickens and and dogs are getting cancer yeah a dog is becoming common that dogs get cancer very very common i mean we, we we've um asked a number of vets and they, i mean they definitely say there's an increase in the cancer incidence in dogs Man. um also, I mean, not only is the carcinogenic, I mean, there's peroxides forming and varnishes forming yeah. in the oil itself. Um, and obviously, uh, you'll meet Wendy a bit later. I mean, she's uh, put together the process of product stewardship where we actually provide a traceability service to restaurants. I'll let yeah. her tell you a little bit more about that so that okay. the restaurants can be ensure, uh, ensured that the products ending up in biodiesel or, or, or the chemical industry. Because a lot of the agents yeah. will go out, yeah, a lot of the agents go out and actually say, you know, a lot of the restaurants are, are get told that the product is going into biodiesel or it is going yeah. to the chemical industry, but you know, we've actually gone out there and we've seen what's happening with the oil. And the, the food chain is paying up to 3,700 Rand a ton, uh, 3,800 Rand a ton of the spent oil. And uh, y you know, we, we're probably talking on a thousand, you know, probably talking about an 800 Rand difference on a ton. We're talking a couple of cents and they are electing to put crap into the food chain instead of taking uh, is, crude oil. This is absolutely shocking. Yeah, it's horrible. It's horrifying. Yeah, a lot of times what happens is um, the kitchen staff, what they'll do is they'll actually take the, take the product, run it through a sock, and then go and use a it. Sock. A sock. yeah, just to get the most okay. of the stuff out. And then, you know, in some cases, there are some restaurants that'll actually sell it back to the staff yeah. as, as extra income. And it's, it's usually a management issue at the restaurant. Not yeah. really the owners don't even know about it. But there's about 51,000 tons of the product in South Africa and probably half that is making its way to the animal feed and I'd say the other half is probably going back into, into the communities. Into the communities. Mm. And at the moment, how much of that is going into biodiesel? At the moment, very little. How many um, are you talking about? 
Uh, we, we, we started, we're probably doing about 50,000 to 75,000 liters a month, which is tiny compared to, oh, the, to yeah. the overall volume. There are some guys in, in Johannesburg uh, that are starting in Durban that have been doing it for a while. Uh, but, but really it's a drop in the bucket. We, we do believe now with the legislation that's come through that a lot more of the product hopefully will go into biodiesel. But what's happening now is we, we're entering in, in a time when the biodiesel manufacturers and the animal food guys are competing. So the price at the moment is a bit of a price war out and there. And the animal feed people should be using good quality absolutely. oil. I mean, they should be using the stuff directly from, I don't know, wherever. Yes, they, I mean, absolutely, yep. Not this. I mean, this is what they're putting into dog food. Is that what you're saying? Yes, this well, I suppose they'll, fil they'll filter it a little bit. Now, why is there this cloudy stuff? And because I know that when they process the oil before it goes to the chipper, mm. are they using the solid slabs or are they using liquid There's oil? There's a lot of a lot of palm oil that's finding its way onto the South African market. And okay. palm oil sort of solidifies at a colder temperature. Right. So because it's a blend of oil, you, 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 the, the palm, palm will sort of go okay. solid and that'll give you that, that, that white effect. Okay. Um, but obviously, I mean, there's small pieces of chips and a lot of, you know, a lot of polar compounds, which are also a problem yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Th that are forming in the oil. You know, as, as I said, not to mention the peroxides and, and the varnishes okay. of, of reutilizing it over and over. Stuff? That's really just of pieces of chips and, and okay. spices. Yeah. And you know, the more they spice, the, the more the oil breaks down. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to go from there? That truck has got a big tank on the back. We put a big plastic tank on the back. The truck comes through to here. And then we'll pump in 10,000 liters of spent oil. Okay. Our and little contribution. So we get 10,000 liters out of the food chain and put it in here. 10,000 liters, okay. And then from there it goes where? We pump that into the two processing tanks over there, the Where's two the black top? tanks. And on the other side, the other side. Sure. Okay. So we pump the oil into here and then we heat the oil. Okay. And then we've got a chemical mixer what on there. What temperature are you heating it sort of to? Um, oh, oh. Yeah, it is quite hot. Obviously, there's certain processes that we'd rather it's not... It's not going into human people. Yes, no, exactly. Yeah, but it's not really. nearly what a fryer would be. I, I, oh, I mean, okay. at a max, at a max 80 degrees. But oh, okay. we, we probably start the process at between 45 and 50 degrees Celsius. So you haven't filtered it yet? You just uh, we it get, when, when it comes from the depot, we've already pre-filtered oh, and pre-preated the oil. Okay. Yeah. And then you put it in here. We put it in here. Heat it up. Heat it up. And then we've got a chemical mixer on that side, yeah. which looks very similar to this tank over here. Yeah, we put the methanol and the potassium hydroxide inside. Methanol. Now, methanol is made from... It's wood alcohol. Wood alcohol. Okay. Yeah. And then and we... that you just buy. You don't, you're not making that. No, we... Cheese, no, right? no, 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 no. Not that organic. Oh, you can use ethanol, which, okay. would, which would be a better product to use, but none of the commercial plants are yet running on ethanol. Okay. Um, so really what we have is wood, wood alcohol, which is the methanol, and we put in potassium hydroxide. Okay. Instead of caustic soda, the potassium is, is a lot more ecologically friendly than the caustic soda. Okay. Uh, we then take, we, we mix that, which then forms a potassium methylate. We mix that with the spent oil yes. and we'll circulate that for a while just to get the whole mix going. And then in about an hour, you'll see a separation of glycerol and biodiesel. And then we drain the glycerol out and we pump the biodiesel through to the wash tank. The and wash then, tank, yeah. yep, and then there we wash. And what do you mean you wash? We actually, any of the excess chemicals, the potassium hydroxide, no. um, will be washed out with the water oh, okay. because the water will absorb any of the excess uh, chemicals All right. and then when the water is mixed with the potassium hydroxide it actually forms a fertilizer and then we use that as a fertilizer so it's like an organic fertilizer organic fertilizer oh. yep and then are you selling the fertilizer not at this time no we not enough the, no it's not that it's not enough we just you know we've been so inundated we've we've got a couple of guys on the project but really with the price of diesel at the moment we've just we just keeping up making diesel. Okay. Um, the University of Stellenbosch is working on uh, some technologies that will help us speed that up. We do okay. understand how to make the fertilizer, but we're probably about two or three months from making fertilizer okay. commercially available. So how many liters do you make a day? Is it 10, Our capacity, no. Look, I mean, there, there's some legislation that doesn't let you do more than 25,000 liters a month without a site license. So okay. this, is, this is a non-commercial plant and a um, this is our R&D plant. It's a yeah. pilot plant we run with the university. Our commercial facility is in Sac Circle, yes. and we're producing about 250,000 liters a month out of out okay. of that plant. Okay. Yeah. So this is just a we do all of our all, all of our R&D yeah, with okay. the university. Yeah. So this is the actual oil. I mean, this is the color. Yeah, this is no. This would be biodiesel. So this, this is would be actual biodiesel. This is biodiesel. Okay. It's unwashed biodiesel. I'll show you when we get inside. There's a 
th this is unwashed, and you'll see there in the drying tank, it's a lot clearer. So that would be washed by a diesel. Now can washed can and, and then off, sorry, after the wash, it goes through to the drying tank, and we okay. actually dry the biodiesel. And then we also, to get all the water out. obviously we've used water, so there'll be water in the biodiesel. Yeah. And then what we do is we actually take the water out, mm -hmm. and then um, it'll form a clear liquid like that. So we sort of dry and polish the biodiesel, and we let it settle for three days, and then we put it into our delivery tanks, and mm. then the guys can pick it up. This is the, some of the criticism has been, well, you know, there's just never going to be enough oil, and people are eventually going to have to be growing crops to provide, you know, this biodiesel, and we shouldn't be growing crops for, for fuel, we should be doing it for food and, right. you know, it goes on and on. But my thinking is if you can grow stuff, it means anybody can grow stuff. But looking at this, it doesn't mean that anybody can just go and make their own biodiesel. It seems no, quite involved. It is, it is quite involved. We've just launched a, a processor that we will make available to smaller brewers of, of yeah. biodiesel. And again, working with the process engineering department at Stellenbosch, um, they're going to come and have a look at it. We've patented the technology. So the guys that are making it, we, we're going to make it as simple as possible for them to make it. So you could have like a small guy on a farm, let's say for example, who could either buy chip oil or a small holding or mm. whatever and make it and then provide an income. So you're creating jobs. Absolutely. Well. The, 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 the goal around that is the, the government has said that um, anyone that's making biodiesel can make up to 25,000 litres yeah. per month and there won't be any taxes on the fuel. Mm. Can you put the fuel into any car? You can put the fuel into any car. Um, the best blend we would suggest would be a 20% biodiesel, 80% petrodiesel. You, the, you won't notice a petrol, um, you, well, a petrol, a diesel uh, consumption difference. Yeah. I mean, obviously, if you're running it at 100%, because it is more of an oxygenated fuel, you will notice between a 7 and a 9% uh, reduction in um, sort of kilometers per liter. Oh, really? So, yes, Mark, yeah. Mark swears, and he's really doing more tests. Yes. He's getting more mileage on it out of a tank of, of biodiesel. Yes. And he said he feels like he's getting more power. Yeah, well, I, I mean, the power, well, the power, the power most certainly is, it's very liberating to, to, to ride with the product, to drive with the product, yeah, most certainly. Yeah, and we're putting in 100%, he doesn't look yeah. at his diesel at all. Look, there are, there are some issues in, in winter around 100%, the, you know, specifically with a lot of palm oil and the viscosity is not exactly what yeah. it needs to be. Um, but yeah, no, they, they, you know, and it depends on vehicle to vehicle. I mean, some vehicles will run better with it, some, yeah. some won't. Um, you know, it depends if it's cold flow injection. It, it really depends on the technology around it. But the... So like a little Renault Clio that my daughter drives yeah. diesel, she would need to just blend it. You say 20% Probably 20% biodiesel, 80% petrodiesel. And then NAMSA, which is the Automobile Manufacturers Association, yeah. they, they're kind of saying, look, at 5%, there's not going to be warranty issues. Certain vehicle manufacturers will go up as high as 20% and say they'll honor the, the, the warranty issues on the, on the vehicle. Why are they saying that? Is it just because they're protecting the petrol industry? No. Or they genuinely can't no, ge no, genuinely it, it can't cause damage if it's made correctly. Yes. Um, some of the older vehicles, there's some issues around rubber degradation on with okay. biodiesel um, the new diesel in South Africa is low sulfur diesel so we have a situation where there is no lubri lubrication in the diesel um, okay so you're saying that it's fine to run your car you're gonna have to test it to see how well it responds to I, I would I would say that given NAMS's guidelines 5% would you can feel very comfortable running at 5% there may not be a huge saving on the sticker price of the fuel, yeah. but just given you've got the added lubrication in your diesel, yeah. given that there's low sulfur diesel, your engine life is definitely going to be extended. There's, yeah. there's absolutely no doubt. Um, you know, and larger fleets should be running at 20% looking at emission reductions. We've been testing with Golden Arrow yeah. since um, October last year. Oh, really? Mm. And uh, we got a very good report coming out of the, um, the emission reductions from Golden Arrow. Yeah. There's 900 buses in Cape Town. So if we can get a 20% blend, yeah. I mean the emission reductions will be phenomenal. A lot and less smog and pollution. Reduce the fuel bill as well. I'm sure at 20% you will reduce yeah. uh, the, the, the fuel bill, but again, you know, at that level, it's, about it's A, it's about emissions at Golden Arrow, and B, it's also about engine life. The, the engine Talking lasts the longer. Emission? What's the difference in the emissions from chip oil, fast mm -hmm. food oil, and diesel? And normal, diesel, yeah. uh, we should probably have done a, a bit of a test so you can see how diesel burns versus how biodiesel burns. Yeah. I mean I, I can actually give you that data, I don't know it off the top of my head, but it's, it's diesel is an extremely toxic product. Yeah. Uh, I mean just period. It smells toxic, it, smells toxic, it is toxic, it's, 
it's not a very nice product. I mean, obviously, there's been huge, huge moves to get to the low sulfur from 3,000 parts yeah. per million to 500 parts, which is, which is, uh, you know, fantastic that that yeah. has happened. Um, but really, you just can't compare the toxicity levels between diesel and biodiesel. Biodiesel will biodegrade in four days if there's a spill on it. Oh, really? It's less toxic than table salt. Um, yeah, no. that's one thing I would like to, I mean, just just mention yeah. is is that I really, really wish that more women would get involved in the in the fuel industry. There's just yeah. there's just not enough women. It's very, very male dominated. And uh, how did you actually get into? Why did you get into biodiesel? What was your motivation? Sure. I, I, I'm probably going to have to share an article about that. My motivation actually started at the 9/11 event, mm -hmm. um, when the two planes mm -hmm. flew into the building. It was a, it was a. Was you coming up for? Yeah, it was a turning point in my life, most certainly. Um, after the event, I was really doesn't feel like I, I fit in the corporate environment anymore. I just yeah. didn't seem to have the same. And you were in what, IT? I was in IT, absolutely. It just, it didn't feel, the world didn't feel the same for me after that. And I kind of uh, spent a year or two, took off from work, did a lot of soul searching. Um, I'd been running at, you know, 999% and not, not done any questioning in life or none of that. So I took two years off and, and really just reevaluated my life and where I am and what I was doing. And then, uh, started dabbling around in, in one or two things but it just felt too corporate based mm -hmm. for me um, met some great friends uh, michelle and uh, anthea anthea yeah, tor yeah. from biofile and enchantrix and really one weekend started chatting to anthea said anthea i need to get into something that can make a difference yeah. she said handed me something on biodiesel and said this is it and the rest is they say is history that's that's how i got into it i mean and anthea you actually started this company called no we started both um, and I understood what was happening with the oil and I understood what could happen with the oil, but really they're two separate companies. TAG is a, is a company that is really focused on waste stream management, if you like, okay. and providing safe disposal certification. Okay. The company at this point is only focusing on the spent oil because that's where biodiesel yeah. is. Um, and really the company started roughly the same time as biodiesel one. Okay. And, uh, is specifically set up to provide product stewardship. In other words, you know, a lot of companies when they sell a product, they don't take responsibility for what happens to the packaging on the product and the contents of the bottle. It's yeah. once they've sold it, they think their job is done. Yeah. And there's a, there's a chain of thought that says, look, you've actually got responsibility for whatever you create from, uh, from cradle to grave. And uh, we've worked extensively with the University of the Free State, well, extensively with information that they make available around product stewardship mm -hmm. to understand where responsibility starts and ends. Mm -hmm. So we're saying, look, as an oil producer, you're making oil available, you know what's happening to that oil. Yeah. You should really step up and become a product steward and say, I will mm -hmm. take responsibility and make sure that whatever I create is, is going to go from cradle to grave. It's going to be looked after and it's going to be looked after satisfactory. You know, what's happening is that a lot of companies don't have staffing or the ability to manage the product stewardship issue they don't they, they, they don't have staff that can say well look we're going to look what happens to the oil from a b c d e f g and that's where tag comes in they essentially outsource their product stewardship yeah. role so they appoint tag as their product steward essentially and then there's an administrative system that we designed in the computer system and that allows you to trace your product so the there's a collection sheet that gets signed restaurant signs it, agent signs it, depot signs it, and then we provide a, a certificate back to the restaurant or to the holding company level or to the health guys, whoever needs it to say that, look, we actually know what's happened from that oil from the time it left the restaurant okay. right up until it was used in biodiesel. Okay. Awesome, awesome company. Oh. Yeah. yeah, I'd just like to introduce Wendy Craig um, from TAG. She's running the traceability service around and product stewardship around the use of spent oil for biodiesel. What is a woman doing involved in such a kind of male orientated um, a, you know, kind of industry? You're involved in you know, tracking this oil for one. I suppose women are detailed people. But how did you get involved with Terry? Where did you meet him? And how did you sort of get to be involved in this? And why are you involved and what do you actually do? First of all, my background is the corporate HR and training um, background. and. Um, I kind of got to a point where I think I was doing a lot of research on myself, trying to find myself and uh, with the result I was attending certain workshops and on that workshop I met Terry okay. 
and we just connected and I also took some time out and we just sort of played a bit and we tried experimenting with all different yeah. odds and ends. And then when Terry got involved with the biodiesel, we both said we wanted to do something that was contributing either community or environmental or something. We just both didn't want to go back into the corporate world because yeah. we believed that there was something else yeah. out there. And so Terry started researching biodiesel and we saw, oh, you can make biodiesel from waste vegetable oil. And so Terry just said, well, why don't you, we need to get some waste vegetable oil. Why don't you start approaching the restaurants? And we thought, oh, well, we'll go there. We'll be doing the restaurants a favor by taking away their waste oil. And uh, yeah, that's when I started discovering what was really happening with the oil, yeah. the abuse, the misleading uh, and everything behind that. Um, as I approached the restaurants, I asked, what are you doing with your waste vegetable oil? And they said, oh, no, uh, it gets collected and it's going into the paint and chemical industry. So I said, oh, OK. And as I started going, getting more and more involved in this, I started becoming familiar with who's who out there. Mm. And I started realizing where the oil really was going. Here, the restaurants are told that the oil is going into the, uh, the, the paint and chemical industry when in actual fact it was going to collection depots that just sell it on to the food chain. Unfortunately, in South Africa, it is legal to put it into back into the food chain. Shocking. What can we do to make it illegal? Um, well, I know that this has been taken up with the government and obviously everything takes time. There's a process to everything. So, and so it's they're taking it and feeding the stuff to the chickens. Yes. And then the chickens are getting killed and going to the restaurants and being fed to the people in there. And the people in the restaurants don't know mm. that <coughs> they're having carcinogenic oil in the chicken. That's right. Um, you know, bad enough that their stuff is fried anyway, but never mind that. And, and the restaurants don't know that, and the people that are in the restaurants don't know it either. Well, it's all sort of, um, you know, behind the scene. It's, it's just, I think, an area that really needs to be investigated and exposed. Yeah. Um, it is, a lot of it is going back into the pet food. Yeah, and uh, and uh, they, food. they spray like a mist spray over the chicken feed. Yeah. And then, yes, that goes back into the human food chain. And as I said, is legal. Um, but research has been done and it's found that the chickens are not able to break down that carcinogenic oil mm. and that is going back into the human food yeah. chain. Yeah. So TAG is there out to create an awareness of what is really going, going on. And um, also, you know, there's a lot of people that are making a living around collecting the waste oil. And it was a situation of where we could have gone in to collect the oil ourselves, but we realized the network is already out there. We need mm. to work with the people that are out there but we need to put in a system. Yes. Um, it's no good handing out certificates to say to the agents, you know, you can mention to the restaurant that you are collecting for biodiesel. It all boils down to money. Yeah. And the agents will abuse that certificate, yeah. say that they're collecting for biodiesel, but then take it to the highest bidder. Yeah. So what we're trying to do is create an awareness and understanding and to, for, for restaurants, to take responsibility and it yeah. all starts with the restaurants. They need to be aware of, of, of set a, a, a basic price structure. And um, what TAG does is we are the link between the restaurant, the, the agent, yeah. the collection depot, and the end user, which is Biodiesel One at this point in time. So we have very tight uh, systems in place, collection control sheets in place, and um, at any point in time, a health inspector goes into a restaurant and they inquire what are they doing with their, their spent oil. We will be able to give that restaurant a full report from the first day that, we, that it was collected through the tag system to the, 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 the last day. Um, so there's a full report of the activity of the, the spent oil. Mm. That is quite amazing. And how long has TAG been in place? I mean. We first sort of started, I think it was in about the end of October, November. That's when I first started going out. I actually started collecting the oil myself with my Bucky. And um, <clears throat> I've got a lady that is now collecting for me and then obviously working with other collection agents that are out there. Yeah. So really my time is spent a lot with um, negotiating with the restaurants creating that awareness and understanding. And we'd also like to take this project a lot further. It's not just about biodiesel, it's about our environment as well as a lot of the product is going back, the waste oil is going back into the community. 
uh, staff members from the restaurants are selling the product into their community because it's, it's cheap. yes. Mm. So um, what Should we're we wanting to do up. is we're wanting to take that toxic product out of the community, mm. out of the food chain, and we want to be able to put back into those industries. So what we are looking at setting up at the moment is um, a charity fund, setting up a charity fund, and for the restaurants that would like to participate, instead of them paying or getting re receiving a rand a liter for their oil, that rand a liter goes into a trust fund. And yeah. it's, 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 you have a restaurant member on that trust fund board so that they can see that there's no uh, mishaps happening yeah. with the, the funds. And as a council board, they can vote as to how to utilize those funds into charity. And our suggestion would be to put that, invest in the community by uh, supplying biodiesel at a reduced price into yeah. the community, uh, eliminating the use of paraffin, which mm -hmm. is highly toxic, mm -hmm. and obviously getting involved with, with animal uh, uh, campaigns. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose, in a sense, we're providing better quality food, I suppose. Yeah. So those are all things we need to investigate. Actually going to the dog food companies yes. and yeah. actually giving them some. I mean, I would like to know that if I am going to buy what I think is the best dog food on the market, let's say somebody out there is buying their best dog food from wherever, mm. you know, I'm buying something that's got no preservatives in it, and it's made from ostrich meat, and it's supposed to be as close to almost organic as you could possibly get in this mm. country. But now I'm wanting to know is what oil are they using? Mm. Because if they're using that oil, there's no way I'm going to buy it. I'm going to have to just go back to feeding my dogs, you know, raw meat and vegetables, which is actually the best thing for yes. me anyway. It's just sometimes convenient to have, you know, some kind of dog food. And that it's going into horse feed. People that mm. have horses are going to want to know what, you know, why are they... Now, I wonder horses get so sick. Well, dogs are getting cancer. Chickens get cancer. Apparently, we leave them something like a week longer than when they're normally slaughtered. Mm. Most of them develop cancer. One in three South Africans get cancer in their lifetime. Mm. And we're putting this stuff back into our lives. And is it like that mm. internationally in the UK? No, they've actually, they've, they've obviously done a lot of research around yeah. uh, waste oil and um, have identified that it is not safe to go back into the food chain, yeah. into animal food chain or into the human food chain. And they have put those legislations in place. Unfortunately, those leg legislations have not carried through here in South Africa. So instead of waiting for those legislations to be put in place, we are putting a system in place to protect the public and restaurants. The public don't even know. I well, mean, this I is it. I went to biodiesel and I know about heated and carcinogenic fats. And I mean, I had no idea until I came here today. I think it's actually very, very important for the public to be aware of what's going on because um, I believe something that we were talking about is you create, create like a green dot association. Yeah, yeah. So if the public are aware of what's going on with the yeah. oil, um, they would want to know that a restaurant is taking effective responsibility mm -hmm. of their oil. Yeah. So perhaps something, this is something we need to look at further down the line. Any restaurants that are going through the tag yeah. system that are managing their oil effectively have like a green dot on their door or yeah. on their menu. Yeah. So when the public go to that restaurant and they see that green dot, they know that that restaurant is taking responsibility for and the we oil. Need again on dog food to know that Absolutely. It, dog food or it needs food to be carried through horse further. Food or whatever. It needs to go right through it so that the consumers can have more of a choice because I mean, I just think of people that are health conscious. They don't want to actually even think or know that anybody's using oil in the restaurant mm. anyway. There's a sort of move away from low fat and no fat. Mm. So they don't want to know about the oil. Mm. And educating them from the restaurant side is making them aware of this fact that oil is being used mm. in the restaurant. We want to know that decent oil is being used mm. in the dog food and the cat mm. food. Otherwise, we're going to find some alternative. Yes, absolutely. And, and we need to be starting to make yeah. those foods with the natural oil. I mean, Unfortunately, it all boils down to price and, mm. and it's a few cents more and no concern as to where the oil really yeah. is going. And that, that is the challenge we are facing at the moment. Um, it's, we approach restaurants and the answer we get, we say, would you like to put your oil into biodiesel? It's currently going into the food chain and they say, well, what can you offer oh. me a better price? Yeah. And that's what it boils down to. And that is 
that is the sad reality. And if the consumers start to say, we're not going to eat at your restaurant because mm. your oil is being used in it. You need five customers mm. to say that to a restaurant here and he's going to start changing mm. his mind because at the end of the day, his money shouldn't be made from old oil. It's made yes. from his restaurant and whatever he serves yes. his patrons there. So it's actually shocking that they're even yes. thinking like that. I mean, for goodness sake, money grabbing for a little bit of extra couple of cents and then poisoning people. Mm. Absolutely. Um, it's shocking. So you're doing, you're doing an incredible job just getting out there. And yes, I think, and you know, we're definitely breaking some uh, uh, walls. Uh, we were told, I mean, often I get told, Wendy, you're fighting a losing battle. Mm. Um, I'm working a lot of, lo working with a lot of odds against me. Mm. Um, but I feel we have already mm. broken down a, a good number of walls. Um, one of the group uh, a restaurant groups that were the first to really come on as a group was yes. Church's Chicken. Oh. They have been absolutely fantastic. They realized immediately the importance oh. of changing their the whole group. We're currently, uh, we're currently working with Steers yes. and trying to, it's, it, unfortunately it works on a franchise basis, so, so it's for the franchise the owners okay. to make the decision. Okay. So um, if people go to a steer, they've got to ask. Yes, what we've actually got is a certificate, it's a, a, a frame certificate that we leave with the restaurant and it's nicely, can be nicely, it's, it's nicely presented and oh. it's put on the uh, uh, cash desk counter. Oh. So should any of the customers see that certificate, okay. then they are, uh, they're made aware that that restaurant yeah. is putting their oil into and I biodiesel. Believe that Nando's is looking at it, but they're not there yet. Yes, there's a couple of restaurants. We're trying to go, take it from a head office level mm -hmm. because it does need to be pushed back from from a head office level, from yeah. a top management point of view. Um, it also takes an incredible long time to to uh, deal with. Uh, um, managers within yeah. the stores because a lot of the managers are pocketing the money themselves yeah, so they don't want okay. to change so um it's yeah it's it's knocking down doors one yeah. by one and um we've had a few meetings with with steers and they are very keen to to uh, do the transformation but mm -hmm. everything has a process so okay. that's where we are i know nando's nando's have been have been made aware of the situation yeah. and they are also yeah. currently the looking at the change Definitely. Public mm -hmm. needs to be made aware of what is going on and needs to question mm -hmm. the restaurants, where is your oil really going? Yeah. And how do I know your oil is really Show going there? Yes. Because somebody's word doesn't mean a thing these yeah. days. So Unfortunately, that. a certificate doesn't mean anything no. either. Anybody can make a certificate. But if they got hold of you, the tag. Yes. And said, are these people registered with you? Yes. Now, what is yes. your email address? It's Wendy, W-E-N-D-Y, yeah. at biodiesel1, that's O-N-E, okay. dot C-O dot Z-A. Okay. And you will give them a list of whoever's involved? Yes. And you can give them information as to what's happening with the oil so that they can go armed with it to their restaurant saying, you're not registered with these people. We're yes. not coming back here if you don't do Yes, I, mean, I will I have a full report. Yeah. Um, also, I've done a bit of research on some of the other group restaurants and I found out exactly who is collecting the oil and based on that I know where the oil is going. Okay, a very, very small percentage of the oil is actually going into the paint and chemical industry. And the reason being is, um, first of all, unfortunately the food chain is able to pay the higher price. Okay. It does not make it viable to, to make biodiesel at those prices, so yeah. we've got to bring the restaurants down in their price. In fact, the restaurants shouldn't be charging for for their waste to be removed yes. so we would like to eventually move that into a charity yeah. uh, organization of some sort yes yeah. um, it's a very honorable thing that you're doing yes and I would like to see everybody changing to buy a diesel and driving diesel cars because right now there isn't really a viable alternative that is I feel safe in the environment as far as mm. you know other than riding a horse yes which is not practical. <laughs> Imagine how long it'll take us to get to Cape Town. Yes, yeah. Thank you for your time, Wendy. It's Thank been, you. Um, fantastic to meet you. Yes. And anything I can do. We've also got a database of about eight or nine thousand people that we can send email information. Fantastic. Out to. So you can email me as much as possible about all of this stuff. I can put it in layman's terms. Yes. And just send them out the basics and put them in touch with you. And who knows? I'll actually give you a brochure oh. and I'll give you some some little information that I do have fantastic. here. Yes. Really, I'm going to sell my car. <laughs>